Okay, so good evening, everyone, and welcome back to uh, the online interactive lecture series uh, that the INU project has been organizing for now for many many months uh, during the essentially the uh, lockdown period. Uh, but as you know, once the kind of lockdown has become a little bit less severe, and we have been moving around a bit, now the talks have been become like once per week, and that is on Monday, like today on all Mondays at 6 p.m. So please come back uh, listening to really interesting talks in the coming weeks as well. But today we have an exciting talk uh, by Professor Eswant Gupta, who is the Center Director of the National Center for Radio Astronomy in TI, that is part of TIFR, uh, located in Pune. Of course, as you know, uh, NCRA runs the world's largest uh, meter wave radio telescope called GMR. Uh, he's going to speak on uh, a topic on astronomy at uh, radio wavelengths. So he's going to kind of take you through the journey of exciting uh, physics uh, on the astronomy using uh, radio frequencies. Prasheshwant Gupta uh, obtained his MS and PhD in radio astronomy from the University of California, San Diego. And before that, he did a bachelor's in electrical engineering from IIT Kanpur. Uh, since about 1991, he has been uh, involved with the NCRA Pune. His work is focused mainly in the study of pulsars, which are essentially exotic uh, neutrino, neutron stars, and the interstellar medium of our galaxy. In addition, he has significant interest and involvement in instrumentation and signal processing. I mean, this is something very, uh, I must, uh, um, I mean, I really had a first hand uh, interaction experience with him. And uh, this is something which I would like to really emphasize on. Uh, over the years, he has contributed uh, generally to the building and running of the GMRT Observatory, truly a world-class instrument, uh, which is built and operated by NCRA, as I mentioned, uh, just located about 80 kilometers from Pune. And uh, he and his team has recently up completed a major upgrade of GMRT, which in fact is called uh, U GMRT U stand for upgrade, and uh, it has also enhanced the GMRT capabilities way beyond what was what has been happening for many decades. He also leads uh, now uh, India's participation in the Square Kilometer Array. You must have heard about this SKA project, uh, an international collaborative project to design and build the next generation global radio astronomy facilities and network of uh, uh, you know. Uh, telescopes. Professor Gupta was uh, conferred the Swansburg Butner Prize uh, in Physical Sciences way back in 2007. And he is also uh, an elected fellow of the National Academy of Sciences of India and as well as Indian Academy of Sciences. So, uh, with these words of introduction about today's speaker, and now it's over to Ashwan for his very exciting uh, picture on astronomy at radio wavelengths. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Satya. And I will just now share my screen and you just let me know if that yeah. is working all right. Yes, perfect. Yes, okay. And uh, so, so good evening to uh, all those who are listening, um, either on the Zoom or uh, on the YouTube uh, link. Um, what I'm going to talk about is astronomy at a wavelength, which is different from normally what we think about, that is optical astronomy. Uh, but actually uh, what we do in radio astronomy. And uh, uh, so this will cover some of the basic ideas and taking us up to the modern times as to what is happening in radio astronomy and what are the new things in the new frontiers. Uh, so let's start from the very beginning. And as you all know that astronomy is the oldest science in the sense that as soon as man uh, settled down uh, and uh, began to uh, look around, one of the first things that uh, attracted his attention was uh, up in the heavens uh, as to what is going on there. And uh, of course, it started with the use of naked eyes because that is where we have the natural detectors for light waves. And of course, all the understanding and all the processing of the information was uh, happening in the human brain. Uh, but these uh, evolved very significantly, as we all know, with the invention of the telescope. And it was uh, this gentleman, Galileo Galilei, who took the newly invented telescope 
and turned it towards the heavens uh, to ask what may be seen there with this new tool. And as we all know, that, that is something that revolutionized astronomy uh, forever. And it's, in, it's interesting to just have a quick look at that evolution in terms of the facilities that were there. And as you can see that uh, if you start with Galileo's very modest telescope from that time to what Newton used and what William Herschel used to the more modern instruments such as in the Mount Wilson Observatory or the Palomar Telescope and these larger behemoths which are the current radio uh, that, uh, optical observatories both currently working and being planned and uh, to be implemented soon, uh, we realize one obvious thing, which is that they're all bigger and bigger. And obviously bigger is better, but it's uh, instructive to just try and understand that why bigger is better because it has direct relevance as we go forward to other wavelengths. So one is obvious thing that bigger telescopes collect more light and hence they can see fainter sources. And uh, so that is what is uh, referred to as the sensitivity of an instrument. And so if it is more sensitive, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, it likely see more objects in the universe, either it will go further deep into the universe because further objects are generally fainter of, or it may be able to see the same nearby object in much more detail. Uh, the other one, uh, which also we uh, need to keep in mind, is that the bigger telescope provides a higher magnification. Uh, that is, it can distinguish uh, better between nearby objects or sources in the sky. And this is technically, as we know, it's called resolution. And the higher the resolution that you have, the better resolution you have, the more details of the objects uh, can be seen. And uh, uh, it's interesting to just step back and ask, what do these two quantities depend upon. And as you can uh, imagine, both of them depend on the size of the telescope. The sensitivity, since it is uh, a measure of how much signal you're collecting, is obviously proportional to d square, where d is the diameter of the aperture. And the resolution uh, is inversely proportional to d and directly proportional to the wavelength of the observation, So, which is given by this famous diffraction formula, lambda by d. And so smaller the resolution, that means closer by objects in the sky in terms of angular separation can be distinguished by that telescope. And so this is important to keep in mind. And that's what allowed radio astronomy to become more and more sensitive and better. And we'll just illustrate that with uh, two examples. So first is uh, our favorite nearby object, the moon. If you look at the moon with your naked eye, this is the kind of image you will see where you can just about make out some uh, structure uh, on the surface of the moon. But the moment you turn the simplest of the optical telescopes to bigger ones, you can start seeing the detailed structure, which means you're able to resolve out objects which were earlier not resolved and see them as distinct items. And you can also start seeing some of the fainter features and we'll illustrate this with one more example, uh, which is a favorite nearby galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, which many of you uh, may have uh, tried to spot with the naked eye, which actually can be seen with the naked eye if you go to a fairly um, uh, dark enough place in the sense that there's not too much light pollution. And that's what it looks like uh, with the naked eye over the very, very small telescope. And as you put bigger and bigger optical telescopes to look at it, uh, you can again see that you can both see fainter sources, whether they are in the field of view or are part of the galaxy, and you can make out much finer detail about what the galaxy structure actually looks like. Right. So these are the two things uh, that uh, uh, to keep in mind. And with that very quick look at optical astronomy, we can now ask what lies beyond the optical wavelengths. And as we all know, that light is just one, uh, one small piece of a very large electromagnetic spectrum, uh, which goes from the lowest frequency or larger wavelength radio waves to the highest frequency, smallest wavelength gamma rays. And that's a pictorial depiction uh, showing the low frequency radio waves and all the way through the visible to the high frequency gamma rays. And um, uh, 
so the natural question that one would ask is that can the same object uh, emit or be studied at different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum? And we'll see in a moment that the answer to this question is yes. And do the different wavelengths give us different or complementary information about the object? And again, we'll see in a moment that the answer to this question is also yes. And the third one, which is also equally interesting in its own right is, can some objects or phenomena be studied only at some wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum? And um, therefore, if you did not have access to that part of the spectrum, then you would not ever know about that object. And that answer is also yes. And we will do this again with the, simple, with the example back to our favorite Andromeda galaxy. So this is the optical image that I showed you a short while ago. And this is what the galaxy actually looks like in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, ranging from radio to infrared all the way to X-rays in this case. And you can again make out that, yes, the object does look different at different wavelengths. There are different parts of the object which become more prominent at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And therefore, uh, you wouldn't see them if you did not have access to that part of the spectrum. And therefore, you are also then collecting complementary information about the composite object by studying it at different wavelengths. So uh, this is something that uh, allows you then to assemble a more complete picture of an object and some objects which can be seen only at specific wavelengths or some parts of some objects or some aspects uh, then become uh, accessible. Uh, and, but as you can imagine that there are certain hurdles to overcome in going beyond the optical wavelength uh, to be able to do astronomy at other wavelengths. And uh, the simplest one, of course, is, uh, as we saw, that uh, eyes are the natural detectors. You need detectors for the different wavelengths. And this happened gradually with time, with the development of technology. For example, uh, even optical detectors moved from naked eyes to photographic plates, charge couple devices, and so on. And uh, we had to wait till radio communication equipment uh, was invented in order to uh, see how to make detectors for radio waves. And we'll see that in a minute in more detail. Uh, the second, uh, which we don't often uh, realize, is that not all wavelengths from outer space reach us. And this you will uh, appreciate very easily when you think about uh, the ozone hole or the ozone layer. And as you understand that, that that's the layer that protects us from harmful UV rays from the sun, which means that you can't receive those UV rays at the surface of the earth if the ozone layer is uh, doing its job. And so that brings us to this aspect where we can ask that what part of the electromagnetic spectrum can actually penetrate through the earth's environment, the environment being the combination of the earth's atmosphere, the ionosphere and so on. And that is measured by this quantity called the opacity. So uh, something which cannot penetrate uh, is what is 100% opacity. And something that reaches us at the surface of the Earth is where the opacity is uh, uh, very low. And as you can see here, and again, so on the x-axis here is the electromagnetic spectrum. In this case, just turned the other way around, going from high frequency uh, gamma rays to the low frequency radio waves. And what you can see here is that there are these two main windows. One is the familiar optical window where the signal can actually reach us. And the other is this large part of the radio window, uh, which uh, goes from about 30 megahertz to about 300 gigahertz, uh, where the signal can actually reach us. Everywhere else, there is some impediment or the other which blocks the uh, radiation from coming down to us. And, and so you can imagine that the any branch of astronomy that would have grown after optical astronomy would be radio astronomy because the signal does reach us. In other places, we had to wait till we learned how to fly observatories on spacecrafts, which can go over uh, the limitation of uh, the Earth's atmosphere or ionosphere, and then try to observe the universe uh, from those locations. Um, and so uh, the question then comes to uh, a look at radio waves. 
and how we learned to be able to uh, understand them and detect them. And so it was, uh, uh, as we all know, uh, Maxwell who developed the theory that predicted electromagnetic radiation could exist at all wavelengths, including radio. And then it was Hertz who actually proved that radio waves predicted by Maxwell do indeed exist, but he declared them to be of no practical use and went on to other things. And then it took these two people, uh, J.C. Bose, who demonstrated for the first time in a controlled experiment that you can actually generate and receive radio waves. Uh, and But again, he did it again as a scientific curiosity and experiment. He did not follow it up. And it was Marconi uh, who did it a little bit later, about a year later uh, than, than Bose. Uh, but he realized the practical importance of what he had demonstrated. So he went on to patent it and then uh, developed the whole uh, gamut of uh, uh, radio communication equipment that followed. Now, even from this uh, 1895 to the point where you could actually detect celestial radio signals uh, was still about 30 years away. And as often happens in astronomy, it was a serendipitous discovery. But before that, I'll just pause for a minute to give tribute to Jesse Bose, who uh, till recently was not recognized as uh, for his pioneering role. But today, uh, he is recognized as the person who first demonstrated uh, how you can generate and receive radio waves. And uh, there's a replica of his apparatus that we have available at the GMRT as a demo, uh, which uh, if you ever visit, you're welcome to uh, come and have a look. And so uh, these detectors, uh, as we just now uh, were discussing, came about as a offshoot of the development of this long distance radio communication technology. Um, and uh, as I was saying that as often happens, the fact that these detectors could actually detect celestial radio signals uh, came about as a serendipitous discovery. And it has its origin in Bell Labs, where um, this gentleman, Carl Jansky, was given the task of debugging uh, transatlantic communication equipment that had been built where they were trying to uh, send radio signals across the Atlantic between uh, Europe and, and the US. And it was picking up some unwanted hiss or static or noise, uh, which they could not understand, which was limiting the performance of the system. And he was given the task to try and understand uh, where in the surroundings this unwanted signal was coming from. And so in order to try and find that out, uh, Carl Jansky built this apparatus, uh, which was actually uh, doesn't quite look like a radio telescope, but it is, it's a combination of dipoles which can pick up signals. And he mounted it on this kind of a rotating platform so that he could turn it around in azimuth in different directions and try to pinpoint where this unwanted source of noise is coming from. And it was surprising found that it was not coming from any fixed direction on the Earth, but was coming from some fixed direction in the sky, which means that as the Earth rotates uh, and the sky <clears throat> goes from east to west, this source was actually uh, moving in the sky. And uh, so that is what led to the conclusion that this was some celestial source. And that's this first record of the detection of the intensity from the source uh, as a function of uh, time in his observations. And so this is now 1936, and the frequency is 20 megahertz, one of the lowest radio frequencies at which you can still receive radio waves from outside. And uh, this then led to the birth of radio astronomy. But in the early days, it was greeted with a certain amount of skepticism by the optical astronomers in the sense of, well, what can we learn from radio astronomy? And uh, uh, so a lot of the initial push uh, to the field was given by radio engineers uh, like Karl Jansky, uh, working uh, in some cases in their spare time. So Groot Reber, who was the next big pioneer, uh, was also a, uh, an engineer. Uh, and in his spare time, in his backyard, he built this contraption, which now looks a bit more like the radio telescope that we uh, think of. And uh, he used this to systematically map the strength of the radio signal coming from the sky. 
and made what was the first radio map of the sky uh, operating at 160 megahertz, which is now 1940. And so it's instructive to zoom in on uh, this first radio map made by Groh Treber. And uh, what it shows is, uh, is a contour plot showing the regions in the sky from which enhanced uh, radio emission is being detected. And as you can see, that the bulk of it seems to be coming from one narrow strip in the sky, which you would realize uh, very quickly is the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, which is something that you can see in optical also, again, depending on where you happen to be looking up in the sky from as a, as a bright band uh, of emission. And uh, in this embedded are stronger sources uh, shown as the peaks of the contours. And uh, these uh, were soon, um, or not soon, but gradually identified as different kinds of objects. So this is the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius. It was the strong signal that Karl Jansky saw in the first experiment. And there are other signals here. Some are from galactic objects. Some actually happen to be from objects which are outside our galaxy. And so uh, this then uh, really got people's attention. And what really got the attention very quickly is that people realized that what you're seeing in the radio sky is very different or complementary to the known optical sky. And uh, that is the brightest radio sources often did not have any significant optical counterparts and vice versa. And so this then um, made astronomers realize that here is a new way of looking at the universe and getting extra information complementary to what we are learning from optical astronomy. And that really gave a, a big push to the growth of radio astronomy. And this is again illustrated by an example. This is again all post facto uh, collection of knowledge. So if you assemble uh, the view of, the ga of our galaxy as seen from outside in the optical, uh, this is what uh, it would look like, which again is the most of the optical emission comes from the disk of the galaxy because most of it comes from stars and the gas and nebulae, which are mostly confined to the plane of the disk of the galaxy uh, and with a bulge uh, at the center of the galaxy. Um, and uh, when you compare that with a similar composite uh, made at radio wavelengths, you can again now see the differences that although a good amount still comes from the plane of the galaxy, its distribution, even in the plane, is quite different compared to the distribution of the optical. And what is also interesting is that a significant amount comes from directions which are significantly away from the plane of the galaxy. Uh, it is as if you know the galaxy had structure um, uh, well beyond what is uh, delimited by the thin disk of stars and gas. And uh, this, again, uh, uh, was soon realized as uh, emission coming from different um, uh, kinds of physical processes uh, which um, work more efficiently at radio wavelengths and uh, are uh, produced by uh, objects um, or species which have a different distribution than what the stars and, and gas uh, in the galaxy have. And uh, so this then uh, very quickly established the importance of radio astronomy and um, uh, the fact that uh, different physical processes were now being uh, studied or accessed. And um, uh, I won't go into too much into the details uh, except to say that uh, a lot of that comes from uh, plasma, charged particles accelerating either in a thermal plasma or uh, in the presence of strong magnetic fields. Uh, and, and uh, producing uh, synchrotron kind of radiation and uh, also other kinds of uh, exotic phenomena such as uh, uh, coherent radiation from neutron stars, uh, again from, from uh, plasma but very highly energetic plasma and, uh, and, and, and so on. And so this then uh, led to uh, a rapid growth of radio astronomy. Uh, Ashwant, uh, yes. at this time, can we, there is a question, can you take it? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, slide number 26, just a couple of slides away. Yeah. 
the the question quickly i'll read for you uh, is uh, radio view of milky way is experimental or simulation uh, the, this is all experimental so as i said this is all a composite made from various observations and collecting them together and then of course projecting it um, as to what view you would see if you were looking from outside the galaxy but it's all this is all data this is not simulation okay and so now what we'll do is we'll just take a detour to understand what are the tools of the trade that the radio astronomer uses in order to do these studies and uh, so if you ask the basics of a radio telescope in principle it is no different from your satellite dish which you use to to see your favorite tv uh, shows or or, or, or channels uh, but there is a uh, one major difference so the basic similarity is that it is a parabolic dish which uh, brings to focus incoming waves uh, at a focal point where there is a uh, what we call a feed antenna which converts the electromagnetic voltage uh, signal into a electrical voltage and that voltage is then amplified and transmitted down and uh, further amplified and detected and the relevant information is extracted from that signal uh, but the big difference is in the strength of the signal so the celestial radio signals are much much weaker uh, and uh, compared to the signals that we use for man made transmissions and uh, there are two things that happen because of that when the moment we also understand that any processing of a uh, voltage uh, through an electronic system introduces intrinsic noise from the electronics itself and also in some cases noise that comes in from the sky or from the environment uh, as uh, part of the incoming signal and uh, so in the presence of uh, this noise if your signal is very very weak then it becomes uh, very hard to detect that signal and extract information uh, so the first thing is that the signal is very weak uh, and the typical unit that we use is one Jansky in honor of Carl Jansky, 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meter per hertz. And that's a very small number. Uh, even if you had a large amount of square meters to collect it and a large amount of bandwidth in hertz to collect the signal, you still end up with a fairly weak signal. And uh, you can look at two sort of uh, ways of understanding this. If you are into electrical engineering, this is a minus 100 dBm uh, is the typical uh, power that you would detect at a typically uh, typical large radio telescope uh, looking at a typical one Jansky source over a bandwidth of a few megahertz or, or more. And um, uh, that's a very small number, keeping in mind that zero dBm is one milliwatt and uh, dB is a log scale. Okay, so, so you can see that we're talking about very, very small power levels. Alternatively, if you run a telescope of that kind, collecting 100 dBm of power for a thousand years uh, continuously, you would collect one millijoule of energy, which is minuscule. Right. So uh, what that leads to in order to a, collect enough signal so that you can get enough sensitivity. So you remember the original thing that uh, the more signal the telescope collects, the more sensitive it can be in order to see faint sources also in order to overcome the intrinsic noise. So if you have a fixed amount of noise coming from your receiver, then the more signal you can collect and feed it to the same receiver, the better will be the signal to noise. So these two considerations then lead to the following. Large dishes, very large antennas, several tens of meters of diameter, hundreds of meters of diameter compared to your satellite dish and uh, high quality low noise electronics so that you can minimize intrinsic noise as much as possible in some cases you cool the receiver to cryogenic temperatures because that is what is, uh, reduces random thermal motions uh, in the electronics which is the main cause of the noise and then and the other thing is that you use to your advantage the nature of the sources often these sources that we look at are uh, emitting over a wide uh, range of frequencies unlike man-made signals which are intrinsically narrow band uh, uh, many of the astrophysical sources are wideband, except for spectral line sources where the signal is due to an atomic or molecular transition. Then by nature, 
that signal is narrow band, but um, all the other sources are typically wide band. They'll be emitting over hundreds of megahertz of bandwidth. So if you can build a receiver and collect signal over a large bandwidth, then you can get more signal. And uh, the last part is that these, unlike man-made sources, these sources are on continuously with the same nature of the signal uh, year after year, uh, century after century. So if you observe the source for longer duration and collect more of the signal, uh, then you can show mathematically that for a given amount of noise, signal to noise, can be increased at the square root of the time of observation that you do. So often observations of the same source will go on for hours, sometimes for days, in the sense that you observe the same source again the next day when it rises in the sky, and then the next day again, and so on. So you can have hundreds of thousands of hours of integration on a given direction of the sky in order to increase the sensitivity and be able to see fainter and fainter sources. Okay, so that's one aspect, but if you remember our original uh, discussion, the other aspect, which is the resolution, which also depends on the aperture, but here now you will see the problem that uh, lambda by D, which is what we had for deciding uh, what the resolution would be, uh, is now completely against our favor because lambda is now much, much, much larger compared to the optical wavelengths, and so uh, what it leads to is that even if you had an antenna of 100 meter in diameter and uh, fully steerable, which is not an easy task to build, and you were operating this at a wavelength of 1 meter, which is 300 megahertz in frequency, your resolution would be half a degree, which is 30 arc minutes. And uh, 30 arc minutes, just to remind you, is the angular size of the moon as seen from the Earth. So what does that mean? That means that you took a 100 meter size giant radio telescope and uh, operating at this frequency and pointed it to the moon. And if there was radio emission from the moon, all you would see is a blurred circle of emission. You would not be able to make out any detail because your resolution is not good enough. And again, if you want to understand, I showed you a radio image of the Andromeda galaxy. But if you made that radio image with this kind of a telescope, you would just see this kind of a blurred picture of the galaxy, not enough resolution. So as you can see now, this became one of the big challenges for radio astronomy in order to be complementary to optical that well you can't really study the object with that detail and it's not easy to build um, much larger size telescopes because they become humongous structures uh, both very expensive to build and support especially if you make them steerable so here are examples where they are now fixed to the earth so this is 300 meters at a SIBO radio telescope uh, but so big that you can't move it so uh, only a little bit of freedom is there at that the focus, you can move the focus cabin a little bit. So it allows you a little bit of uh, leeway. Otherwise, it is observing only at the meridian. So whenever the whatever object crosses through the meridian as the Earth rotates, it will be able to observe it for a few minutes, but uh, not more than that. But if it is sensitive enough, then even in those few minutes, you can get a reasonably sensitive signal, uh, which you can use. So. Uh, but you can get a higher resolution and uh, there is uh, similarly today there is a 500 meter size telescope recently built in china but these as i can say are much harder to build and operate and uh, finally even a few hundred meters is not good enough to get to the resolution that you can match the simplest optical telescopes so this uh, remained a challenge till uh, this gentleman sir martin ryle uh, worked out a way to overcome this. And the uh, solution uh, is as follows that as far as the resolution is concerned, you can synthesize the effective resolution of a much larger antenna by building many smaller antennas and placing them at uh, significant distances and then combining the signals from all of them in a particular fashion. And I'll just talk about that in a minute as to how that is done. And uh, what he showed is that if you do this properly, then you can get uh, an, a resolution which is now determined by DS, where DS is the largest separation between the antennas in the array, rather than the size of the individual antennas. And uh, this technique is called uh, aperture synthesis. Uh, also, generally, we call it interferometry, and I'll show why it's called interferometry in a minute. And uh, this was a game changer. Uh, as you can see, uh, it was worth the Nobel Prize for hitting upon this idea. And let's look at this a little bit more in detail. Uh, 
for those of yes, you. Well. Who, yes. Uh, I, I think uh, there is a question. I think it just a clarification is what is required, so that uh, the so that's why I'm asking sure. the question. So he, this he is confused between. Uh, okay, let me read this question anyway. How did you convert the radio waves data into optical, visual, visible data as you showed uh, Andromeda Galaxy? The radio waves are invisible. How did they convert it to visible image? So I think. Oh, you mean uh, why? How we end up with the visual picture? <laughs> I think. Um, is that the question? Because we are not converting yes, yes, radio waves yes. into optical, but we are showing you finally right, right. a visual That's picture, a right? right? Yeah. So it is like any other thing, right? I mean, this is color coded. I mean, like when you look color. at an atlas or a map, right? A map shows you heights of mountains and uh, the depths of the ocean. Those are just coded. Uh, those are color coded and uh, or or contoured plots. So this is color coded. This is simply that uh, the uh, the white represents a certain intensity of the radio signal, uh, black represents absence or or very weak radio signal, and then uh, the uh, there are shades of the color in between. So this is like you would do in any other image. It's yeah. it's color coded to yeah. represent. But the fundamental quantity being shown is the strength or the intensity of the received radio signal. Same. coded uh, by a, a simple color coding scheme or by a contour plot or just a, in some cases a grayscale uh, coding uh, and uh, so uh, if you want to understand uh, what is the magic behind the technique uh, that uh, Martin Ryle proposed uh, it uh, you need to uh, those of you who are familiar with the Young's double slit experiment uh, you can start from that, where uh, when you have two slits uh, illuminated by coherent light, uh, it produces a, uh, a, a, a oscillatory pattern on the screen, uh, uh, intensity, maxima, and minima. Uh, it, it, you, uh, the all uh, radio propagation uh, follows the principle of reciprocity which means that if you had such an intensity distribution available and you were to observe it with two such um, observing locations as um, indicated by the positions of the slit, uh, then you would observe a certain sick correlated signal uh, between the two observing points. And uh, that, uh, but if that kind of intensity variation was not there in the source, you would not observe uh, any significant correlation of the signal between those two slits. But if it was at a different frequency, that oscillatory signal, then some other spacing between the two slits would again respond to that. Right? So if you appreciate that, then you can see that one pair of antennas, when the signal between them is correlated, uh, that is, you calculate the cross, uh, technically, you call it the cross spectrum. Uh, is obtained, then its strength or amplitude is responding to one sinusoidal oscillation in the image play. Uh, and if you appreciate that, then you can see that what you're doing is actually you're measuring one Fourier component of the image. And here, when you're talking about Fourier uh, domain, we are, this is not the temporal Fourier domain that we're used to. This is a spatial Fourier transform. It's a two-dimensional Fourier transform. So if you think of the signal, as the image intensity distribution on the sky plane as a two-dimensional image, and you take its two-dimensional Fourier transform, it will contain various uh, components, uh, just like the Fourier transform of any signal does. And the antennas with different separation uh, pick up these different Fourier components uh, when the signal received by them is put through this kind of a signal processing uh, algorithm. And so effectively, uh, by having different antennas, uh, when you combine them pairwise, uh, which are located at different distances, and the distance here is a two-dimensional vector. So even if two antennas have the same distance between them, but one is north-south, other is east-west, then they're measuring two different Fourier components of the image. And uh, so um, essentially what you're doing is you're assembling the image in the Fourier domain. And when you've got enough of these Fourier components, uh, which depends on the number of antennas that you have, and for n antennas, we'll have nc2 
such pairwise combinations. Uh, some of them may be redundant, uh, but most of them will be unique. That depends on how you do plan to place your antennas. And then uh, you, when you've collected enough of them, uh, you do finally an inverse, uh, two-dimensional inverse Fourier transform uh, to get the uh, image or the brightness uh, distribution of the radio uh, brightness in the sky. Okay, so this is the way of understanding uh, how you can now get the higher. So now you can imagine that the further away antennas will respond to the highest frequency of uh, component in the image. And that is what gives you the higher resolution. When you can uh, distinguish a high frequency oscillation in the image, that means you will be able to see objects which are separated by those kind of distances corresponding to the periodicity of that oscillation in the sky plane. So this then allows you to uh, get the higher resolution, but it comes at a cost. As you can see, there's a fair bit of complicated signal processing happening here. You have to uh, bring the signals from all the antennas back to a common location. You have to convert them down and then correlate them. And uh, so there, there's, and all of this has to be done in real time because the rate at which this signal is coming in is too high for you to record it and do it. So in some cases now it is done and then we'll come to that in a minute. And uh, so there's a fair bit of uh, uh, signal processing hardware and cost of electronics that is required then to do this, but it is doable and uh, it's done now routinely. And so this is just an example of what it can do. So this is now um, uh, an image. The top one is a, is a contour image. Uh, the bottom one is a black and white uh, grayscale uh, intensity coded image. So they are somewhat different, but they are of the same object. It's the, one of those radio galaxies. And um, what you can and this one is made in the era of the large single dishes before. This instrument that I showed you in the previous slide, that Y-shaped uh, multi-antenna uh, array called the VLA. And this is an image made with the VLA. And now you can see the difference in terms of the resolution that you can make out much finer detail in the image. You can uh, say that what looks like one blurry central dot is actually a very small compact object. It happens to be the core of the galaxy. And that these lobes from which strong radio emission is coming have all kinds of integrated structure which you can make out much more clearly in the lower image than you can on the top. And uh, so you can then see the power of the higher resolution. Uh, Ishwan. Uh, yes. Yes, one of the probably a student was asking uh, the, how the VLA, uh, you know, how do you improve the resolution by VLA? I mean, it, uh, you want to kind of repeat if possible, uh, just in a few words, how that helps improving the yeah. so, so as I said, that the way the yeah this when you combine the signals from the antennas uh, at different distances, you can actually pick up the components of the image where the signal is fluctuating at a very uh, rapid rate in the spatial domain, uh, which means that now you are sensitive to fine structure in the image, which is what resolution means that you can see the fine structure. So two objects which are nearby, uh, one of them will fall at the uh, crest of the sine wave, the other may fall at the trough or, or the middle, and uh, they will produce different levels of signal, if you want to think of it in very simple ways. But uh, finally, when you, you know, combine all of that, uh, then you can actually uh, get... Uh, in. So you can think of it in a different way. Supposing you could actually build an antenna, uh, which is continuous and covering this entire region, uh, like this dish. And then you would collect the signal following on every bit and piece of it and just add it and you would get uh, what is done here, uh, which is when you put it, bring it to focus with a parabolic shape, that's effectively what you're doing. Uh, here, uh, many parts of that are missing, okay? But still you can show that you can synthesize the image with the resolution which corresponds to an antenna of size uh, equal to the extent of the array. And uh, there are issues there. You may think that how come with such a limited coverage you can recover all the information. So there are things we are not getting into that this inverse transform has uh, conditionalities because you are trying to recover image from incomplete information. You don't have uh, the all the points in the Fourier domain, but uh, that's we, 
we won't go into the details of how it's done. The technique is established, it works reliably, gives you uh, the very good images of uh, high fidelity and uh, corresponding to actual reality. Uh, there is, of course, one other thing, like I said, in the simplest case, you would have just added the signal from all the antennas to get the maximal uh, amount of signal, uh, but foregoing this ability to get the high resolution. And sometimes that is useful because there are, uh, you know, finally, there is a limit here, lambda by ds, and if you have very compact objects which uh, won't show any structure on uh, this kind of a scale, then, uh, and I'll give you a simple example is a star, a neutron star in the galaxy uh, would uh, not get resolved into its actual detailed structure of emission uh, with this kind of resolution. And so often for such compact radio sources, uh, you there's no point doing all that complicated, uh, uh, you know, signal processing electronics. The most useful thing is to just add the signals and make it look like a large single antenna. Uh, on the other hand, since you don't do all those complicated electronics for that, you can uh, record the data at very high time resolution and high frequency resolution and use it to study the details of the object, especially if it's a transient object like a neutron star is. And so this is what is called a beamform or array mode. And this is not very different from any kind of array signal processing like sonar or radar where you're just you know, adding the signals from multiple receiving elements with certain phase differences between them to get one single output, uh, which uh, points the array in a given direction and looks at that source in great detail. Um, so one simple question you could ask that if this can be done uh, on uh, connected antennas, which are sort of, you know, tens of kilometers uh, apart from each other, uh, can you extend this to uh, antennas which are spread out over much larger distances because remember the larger the distances which is spread out the antennas the higher resolution you can get and so this now is called very long baseline interferometry because the baseline is that typical length between the antennas and so here we are talking about correlating the signals from antennas which are located across an entire continent and you can ask how do you get the signals together to a common place and uh, the that is a challenge uh, because you have to now record the raw voltage coming out from the antenna uh, onto some high fast recording uh, system and then uh, in traditionally it used to be on tapes or no, hard disks but uh, and then bring them together to some common location where you carry out that signal processing that was described today uh, it's possible with in almost real time uh, with optical fibers connecting all of these locations to some common place and you put that wide band with high uh, time domain signal on optical fibers bring it together and do the correlation but if you do it successfully you can get resolution which is now milli arc seconds uh, compared to the 30 arc minutes that we started with uh, when we were first talking about the early days of radio astronomy and you can imagine then of course that if you can do this uh, then you can do this also, where the antennas are actually located in different continents. And yes, that's possible. And uh, all of you who followed the uh, first radio image of the shadow of the black hole, uh, that was an experiment done at uh, high radio frequencies, uh, but in the multi-continental VLBI, where antennas were located at uh, different locations. And then the signals were correlated to get the high resolution so that you can go zoom in on the black hole at the center of a faraway galaxy. And uh, you can then take one more leap from there and ask, can you do this? Uh, which is that you have some of your antennas out in space, uh, which have been sent there on, uh, on a rocket and unfurled over there. Uh, and then so there's a small satellite uh, which is carrying this antenna. And uh, it is looking at the same source that the antennas on the Earth are looking at. And the signal collected by this is then uh, converted, uh, beamed down. Uh, this is now like you're beaming down your satellite channel from uh, your, from your satellite uh, uh, transmission onto a Earth uh, antenna at Earth, which is just receiving it like a communication antenna, and then decoding that signal back, and then correlating it with the antennas located on the Earth. And uh, yes, this is uh, has been demonstrated. It is called Space VLBI. Uh, only a few projects done so far, but probably more will happen in the future. 
And this was one particular project called Radio Astron, which was actually built um, in Russia and launched. Um, it's now just finished its lifetime a few years ago. In fact, one of the electronic components was produced in India in, by our group, Space Qualified, at SAC Ahmedabad, and uh, sent uh, to Russia to be uh, incorporated into this project. And, uh, and so some of the data, uh, we have had colleagues who worked on the data obtained from this mission. But what this allows you now to zoom in really with the very high resolution, because now your longest baselines are of the order of 10,000s of kilometers or, uh, or more. And now that central, that central dot that I showed in that radio image of Cygnus, uh, the typical radio galaxy, you can now break it up into what it looks like in detail. So that jet of emission, and uh, how the core of the galaxy is actually sending out that jet. You can break that down into more detailed structure and you see that there are knots of uh, material flowing out in that jet of emission. So this is now getting into much higher and higher resolution to be able to study the phenomena in much higher detail. Okay, and then one other thing which uh, is always of great interest to all of us, uh, which is uh, of specific attraction in radio astronomy is this question of um, is there intelligent life elsewhere and if so uh, uh, how do we detect it and this is what is called a search for extraterrestrial intelligence and it is obviously uh, you know based on this premise that when we communicate uh, our favorite uh, uh, via media is radio communication so you would think that if there was an alien trying to signal to us uh, that they would be using radio uh, communication as the method and so therefore uh, radio receiving antennas on the earth are the best bets for actually picking up some intelligent transmissions and so from that hypothesis is uh, built this whole business of large radio telescopes spending a fair bit of time uh, observing in possible directions where there may be uh, sources of intelligence, which is again looking at nearby stars and now today with the idea of which may be more habitable stars and then from there tomorrow as the world, this discovery of exoplanets brings you to the point where you say, well, here is a planet which looks more likely to harbor uh, Earth-like conditions and therefore maybe life. So you turn these kind of antennas more dedicatedly to those kind of objects and see if you pick up something. And so this is a very uh, difficult problem. It's uh, worse than this proverbial needle in a haystack uh, kind of thing, because not only uh, is the haystack huge, and the needle is small, you don't even know what the needle looks like in the sense, what is the nature of this signal that you're looking for? But uh, all that said, uh, man's curiosity drives one to spend a lot of time, including dedicated telescopes, which are built to study uh, SETI. Uh, and some of you may know about this program of City at Home, where if you have spare computing power on your laptop or computer, you can actually use it to help search for these uh, signals in the data that is recorded from such observatories. Uh, okay, with that, what we'll do is we'll just spend a few minutes uh, looking at how uh, radio astronomy has grown in our own country and uh, taking uh, our own uh, giant window wave radio telescope as a case study of a modern radio telescope. So radio astronomy in India started in the 1960s. Uh, it was started in two places primarily, uh, one in the TIFR by Professor Govind Suru, and the other was a group in the Raman Research Institute uh, by Professor Radhakrishnan. And uh, these uh, groups grew uh, with time, making uh, very important contributions to the growth of radio astronomy, not just in India, but in the world. Uh, this was the first radio telescope built by our uh, radio astronomy group of TIFR, located at Kalyan. So yes, this is the same Kalyan that we are familiar with as the suburb of Mumbai, where you would I think it unimaginable that uh, someday a radio telescope existed there, but it did. And uh, uh, this is an example of a different kind of radio telescope using dipole antennas located at a place called Gaudi Bidnur near Bangalore, which is, was built by the Raman Research Institute. And there's also a facility by the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, uh, which are uh, uh, working uh, facilities over there. Uh, then back to our group, which built in 1970s, the UTI radio telescope, which is even today operational and used for various kinds of science. 
and more recently a group uh, in the 1990s onwards built the giant meter wave radio telescope uh, which uh, is one of the largest facilities at low frequencies in the in the world and so we'll just focus on the gmrt just to understand how a radio telescope is built and what it does and so the gmrt is a uh, uh, low frequency. So as I showed you, that radio window is quite vast uh, and no single radio telescope can really cover that range of frequencies. And so radio telescopes are built then to specialize in some part of that uh, radio spectrum which is visible from the ground. And ours is a low frequency. So the lowest is around 30 megahertz. So we are close to the lower edge of the visible radio frequency or accessible radio frequency band going from about 100 to 14, 50 megahertz. And uh, like all modern telescopes, it's an array telescope. So it's an array of 30 antennas. Um, uh, each of them still quite large, 45 meters in diameter, spread out over 30 kilometer uh, region. And I'll show that in a minute. And it was designed and built completely indigenous in the country uh, during the 1990s and operational since 2002 as an international facility open for use by anybody from the world. And recently, in uh, just around the middle of 2018, we completed a major upgrade of the facility, which has made it even more versatile with increased uh, sensitivity and capabilities, which uh, keeps it at the forefront on the global scenario. So if you zoom into the JMRT, this is what the configuration looks like. It's again, roughly a Y-shaped array uh, with a central concentration of 12 antennas in a one kilometer or one kilometer region and the remaining 18 spread out like this going out to the largest radius of a bit over 14 kilometers. So this allows you to synthesize a radio antenna of uh, more than 28 kilometers sort of in diameter. And uh, uh, it's not too far from Pune. So this is the Pune Nasik Highway. If you're traveling on this, it will cut right through the array and uh, you're welcome to stop by and visit if you're doing that. Uh, if you Google, uh, which normally uh, we Google everything nowadays, uh, Google will show you this uh, as an image. This is the image of the central one kilometer by one kilometer, where you can just about make out the individual antennas. Uh, you can zoom the Google image. You can start seeing the individual antennas a bit more clearly. This is the closest, um, three closest antennas, uh, which give you the shortest spacings. and. Uh, uh, this is the main building at the observatory. Uh, this is the main receiver uh, rooms where the signal from all the antennas are brought here. And uh, we use optical fiber to transport the signals from all the way up to the 14 kilometer for this antennas to here. And then it's converted back to electrical voltage and all that signal processing that I described is done in the receivers here. And there's a control room from where you can control the entire observatory uh, running of the complete system uh, set, uh, you know, how the antennas, uh, where they are pointing, which source they are following, for what duration, uh, configure all the electronics and watch the data flow through the receiver to the recording and uh, look at snippets of the data as it goes by. All of that is possible. One person sitting here can control the entire observatory running an observation for several hours at the end. Uh, this is a view from the nearby hill showing the central square antennas. Uh, uh, this is a close up. So now you can see what 45 meter diameter means. Uh, uh, this is a uh, to access the low noise, uh, the, the, the feed antennas and low noise electronics, which sits uh, at the focus here. Uh, you need a crane which uh, goes up to 30 meters in height in order to be able to uh, get people to work over there and uh, do this. Uh, you can also notice an interesting thing that this antenna looks like uh, transparent and that uh, how does it block and reflect radio waves. Actually, there's a very fine mesh here, which acts like the reflecting surface, uh, which is uh, good enough to function uh, close to an ideal reflector for the wavelengths at which this telescope works. Uh, this is an example of how such a large antenna is built. It sits on this concrete tower, which itself is equal to a three-story building. And uh, on top of that is the superstructure uh, on which the antenna sits the, this is the rotation axis here where it rotates in azimuth and then this is the uh, other rotation axis here where it can rotate in elevation and then uh, the dish is assembled at the bottom and lifted up put in place and you get the final working antenna 
Uh, this was like I was saying, built during the 1990s, and uh, this is a, a photo from the uh, ceremony for the dedication of the JMRT uh, towards the end of 2001, uh, when uh, uh, the honors were done by Sir uh, by Shira Tata, who's the chairman of the TFR Council. Uh, and uh, since then, it's been open to astronomers from all over the world, and it is really used by people from all over the world. So you can see this kind of distribution of the users. So about 50% of the principal investigators for various projects come from India, and about 50% come from uh, different countries. And the way it runs is that um, the uh, observatory takes proposals from all over the world, twice in a year, six-month cycles, and these proposals are reviewed by a, a review committee, which can call in any expert to review particular proposals. And this committee then decides which are the proposals that are worthy of being uh, run on the telescope as experiments. And those um, proposals then get to run their experiment, get the data, and uh, do the science with it. And um, in any such system, uh, there's a certain number of hours in any six month cycle that you can run the telescope uh, but the demand of the number of users who put in proposal is generally higher so this is like a supply and demand problem the demand is uh, typically two to three times more than the supply and what that means is that there is competition so the committee has a tough time uh, deciding which are the best projects and really only the best projects get time on the telescope for doing the science and you can ask what is the kind of range of science that is done by a facility like the GMRT. Uh, it's quite vast, uh, all the way from trying to study radio emission from our sun to looking for extrasolar planets by trying to detect radio emission, uh, just a bit like Jupiter puts out strong radio emission. So you can ask, can I detect Jupiter-like planets around other stars? From there, all the way to studying neutron stars to other different galactic objects like supernova remnants, microquasars, explosive transient events like gamma ray bursts and today fast radio bursts and so on and uh, various hydrogen in various forms Hydro uh, you know neutral hydrogen which emits a signal at 1420 megahertz which is right in the middle of the radio band to ionized hydrogen uh, like i was mentioning earlier plasma uh, and various uh, kinds which allows you to probe both our galaxy in great detail uh, and also radio properties of different kinds of galaxies, including large clusters of galaxies, and uh, studying these typical, uh, these um, special galaxies, which emit very strongly in radio, uh, which are very normal or very faint in optical. So again, the same complementary view of the universe, uh, which can be seen up to large distances in the universe, and the cosmology and the early universe as to how the universe formed, how it has evolved, when did the first stars and galaxies form in the universe? All those kinds of things can be studied by this kind of a facility, as well as making maps of the uh, entire sky that can be seen from uh, the observatory. And so this is like a uniform coverage that you try to scan the entire sky uh, with a uniform configuration of the observatory and uh, trying to make a full scale atlas of the sky at a given frequency. For example, this was done about uh, uh, now almost seven, eight years ago at 150 megahertz with the GMRT. Uh, this uh, remains to date one of the most sensitive atlas of the radio emission of the uh, sky at 150 megahertz. And uh, like an atlas, it is used by different people to come back and refer uh, to get data. Uh, what does the sky look like in that particular direction at 150 megahertz? Do I see this particular source? Just like you would go to an atlas to check various kinds of things. And as a result of all this, there are many interesting new results that are produced and uh, typically about 50 or more papers in international refereed journals every year, uh, which are based on uh, GMRT data by people from all over the world. So uh, uh, at the end, I'll just point out one thing which would have become um, uh, obvious to you while listening to all this, that a facility or observatory like the GMRT is a culmination of all kinds of engineering. There are all kinds of subsystems that need uh, to uh, fit together and work properly, all the way from the mechanical system to make such large antennas in an uh, economical and efficient fashion, 
to the servo system, which is the system which moves or drives the antennas, positions them and tracks them uh, as the source moves in the sky, as the earth rotates in the source, has to be tracked, uh, which is a very pre fairly precision servo system. Uh, from there to the actual uh, electronics, the radio frequency electronics, which is in these little an feed antennas, which pick up the signal and you want them to be as wide in frequency coverage as possible. From there to the low noise uh, amplifiers and electronics, which sit right there at the focus of the antenna. And from there to bring the signal down, send it over optical fiber uh, with wideband optical fiber transmission to the central station, where again, it is converted uh, and then digitized and then rest of the processing is done in digital. And that again, is a very complex digital processing. Uh, reaching up to 20 teraflops of uh, continuous real-time computing uh, with 20 gigabytes uh, gigabits per second kind of sustained data flow. And then in order to control all of this is the entire telemetry system, which is distributed over the 30 kilometer uh, range where the, from the central building, you talk and control the aspect of the antenna and the electronics as well as monitor it. And uh, that combined with then the software that runs to um, make all this function as a coordinated observatory running in the control room. And then finally, the software which is used for doing this processing of the uh, making the images that I described earlier, uh, which is also fairly sophisticated and trying to extract the best possible signs from all of the data. So all of this uh, goes together in order to make it work. and. Uh, um, just to end on the GMRT, that it has produced several interesting and exciting new results uh, uh, over now more than 15, so over the 18, 19 years uh, that it has been open for international participation. And meanwhile, uh, about seven, eight years ago, we realized the need to upgrade it, to keep it uh, as one of the most uh, uh, competitive and sensitive facilities in the world. And that was started in 2012. And we finish that, uh, which gives it a more complete frequency coverage uh, over this entire range of frequencies. And uh, it gives it a much larger bandwidth that it can operate in. So you remember again that the bandwidth that we saw in the beginning, the, the larger the bandwidth, the more sensitive you can make it. And we've increased the bandwidth by more than a factor of 10. And uh, uh, many and some other changes in electronics which make it a better facility and modern servo system and modern monitor control system, all those changes and improvements. And finally, just to drive home the point that when you have something as sensitive as uh, the JMRT, you can actually use it for some other things, uh, which is not core astrophysics. And this is one example of. Uh, providing uh, ground station support. So as you know, that uh, any space mission that goes out uh, needs to talk uh, to uh, the uh, central uh, facility. So in ISRO has its own large antennas for monitoring the radio transmission from its probes. And so the further away the probe goes, the fainter, of course, is the signal. And the more sensitive needs to be your Earth station that receives it. And uh, this is an example where uh, uh, we worked in collaboration with uh, the with NASA and the European Space Agency to use the GMRT as a very sensitive Earth station to receive the very faint signals, uh, which were transmitted as the diagnostic signals from this uh, probe to Mars, uh, ExoMars, which a bit like Chandrayaan-2 had a module which separated and uh, attempted to make this descent to land a uh, lander module on the surface. And uh, uh, we could uh, track that signal. So this is a three watts of signal. It's like taking your mobile phone to Mars and uh, that signal being picked up uh, by the array. And uh, we could actually detect that signal. And uh, this shows that the Doppler variation of the velocity of that object as it made this transition. So this reminds you of the plots you would have seen live for Chandrayaan 2, where a similar thing was happening that you're tracking uh, what's happening to the probe and here also we were doing that uh, and this signal was being relayed live from GMRT to Germany at the control uh, station of this mission and a bit like Chandrayaan 2 just about uh, uh, a minute or so before the expected touchdown the signal was lost 
and this was seen immediately at the GMRT control room, and they knew that something had gone uh, wrong with the mission, uh, just like we knew in Chandrayaan 2. And this also actually uh, crashed uh, on the surface because of uh, uh, error in the way uh, it was uh, functioning. Uh, but this just shows that uh, such kind of things can be done with radio telescopes. So now uh, I realize that I've sort of gone for an hour and uh, so I could stop here. The last part was just looking at the future, a few slides beyond uh, what lies uh, up to the SKA and beyond. But uh, I could stop here as a logical stopping point because uh, it's already 7.15. Uh, I leave that to my host to say. Yeah, but uh, I think it's okay. Maybe we can, uh, I mean, you can take uh, five more minutes and maybe give some uh, okay. directions. So sure, I right. think that's... Many younger people are on that. Yeah. Yes. So uh, let me just motivate this as follows that GMRT is a major, a major national level facility. So it's built by a nation, by us. Uh, and today, if you build it, it will cost around 500 crores. Of course, it was about 10 times less uh, in the uh, 1990s when it was built. Okay. Uh, but uh, as you can see, you now that's not a small amount for a nation to uh, afford. Now, if you want to build something 10 times more uh, sensitive than the GMRT, so you can imagine that that is an amount, uh, it goes into a realm which is difficult for a single uh, nation to, uh, to take up and build. So at an international level, in order to go to the next generation of facilities, uh, countries are coming together and pooling together their resources, both in terms of technology, knowledge, as well as money in order to build the next generation facilities. And uh, one of the ones that is sort of on the horizon is the square kilometer array, which is a truly a next generation radio astronomy observatory, which has just finished uh, the design phase and construction of phase one uh, will start by the end of next year and expected to uh, take five, six years to build it. And uh, uh, this now you can see that this is the cost and uh, uh, this is now being pulled in by many countries contributing. And uh, this phase one will be much bigger than GMRT. It will have 200 antennas spread out over 180 kilometers. Uh, uh, and uh, there are two parts to it. The, uh, the, uh, the part which works at higher frequencies, similar to the range of GMRT frequencies, but going to higher than that, uh, will be made of uh, using dishes, uh, but slightly different kind of dishes than the GMRT uh, antennas smaller in size, also different design, uh, which is uh, um, expected to give better performance. And the low frequency part, which goes below 300 megahertz down to all the way to the limit of say 50, 30 to 50 megahertz, uh, will be made from dipole antennas, which you can see a cartoon illustration over here, uh, where there's a field of dipole antennas where you collect the signal from dipoles and combine it to make it uh, a station station you can think of analogous to a dish antenna and there'll be many such stations spread out over the array just like individual antennas are spread out in an array and so these are the two complementary parts of the observatory one located in australia and south africa and the reason for choosing those places are those the locations which are far away from man-made uh, sources of noise which is one of the biggest challenges for radio astronomy and uh, so this is a global alliance and india is also a part of this and so this is what is projected to be there in South Africa, uh, in the northern part of South Africa, the center of the array. Um, and uh, this is the kind of thing where there will be 200 of 15 meter size uh, antenna spread out over 150 kilometers. And in Western Australia, at the edge of the Australian desert, uh, this is a 130,000 dipole antennas uh, in uh, in uh, around uh, uh, spread out over 80 kilometer region, uh, working at the very low frequencies. And uh, it's a global collaboration. Already there are 10 plus countries which are part of it, more others who are interested in joining and uh, pulling together the both the technical resources as well as the financial resources in order to build something like this. There'll be a global headquarters of the project located in the uh, UK near Manchester. And uh, as you can imagine, when we looked at the GMRT, that if you build something which is uh, more powerful, 
you'd really be pushing the envelope in several technology areas, uh, which is, uh, as I showed you, different kinds of antenna design principles and uh, the much better quality uh, cooled. Uh, so in JMRT, we don't use cryogenic cooling because it's quite expensive. But here, the receivers, especially in the scale mid, uh, will be cooled uh, cryogenically to low temperatures. And then, as you can imagine, this fiber network to transport the signals from large number of antennas to the central processing station. Uh, in the final SK is petabits per second, which is more than the total internet traffic that flows today. And the computing required in order to process the signals and finally to make the images from the recorded uh, data is uh, the best supercomputers of that era in the next 10 years uh, is uh, what would be required in order to process the data. And then you can imagine in order to make all this run in a coordinated manner as an observatory, fairly sophisticated management and control software for making this vast distributed observatory uh, run in a coordinated fashion. And then finally, uh, huge amounts of data that would come out of it. Uh, and really, we talk today about big data as the uh, challenge and uh, then techniques to work with big data, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, in order to be able to uh, get the best in the most efficient manner from the data. And uh, not to mention uh, storage and transporting the data across the globe to different uh, uh, users in the different countries. All of these uh, would be uh, the all next generation cutting edge technologies that uh, some of those have already now been worked out in the design phase and now the actual work on constructing it is going to start by end of next year and we are hoping that india will be active part of that uh, collaboration and that Indian astronomers will be able to use that facility uh, to do the next generation of science so with that i'll end here with the summary uh, which i won't read out but we've sort of gone from the basics of you know, how we listen to the universe using radio waves to what is the typical uh, radio antenna looks like and why the need for a raise of antennas came up and what kinds of sophisticated engineering and technology is uh, required to do these. And we discuss some of that in the light of the GMRT and the kind of science it does. And uh, then from there, we talked about the future, which is the SKA. And we also looked at side issues, whether it is space exploration experiments or the search for extraterrestrial intelligence okay so i hope that was uh, uh, that was useful especially for the younger generation to try and understand what radio astronomy is all about since there are more questions we can take those yeah uh, so thanks Ashwant, uh, for a very very interesting uh, talk i mean really uh, you took us to you know several decades of uh, Indian radio astronomy from all the way from GMRT, uh, ORT, GMRT, of course, upgraded. Now, at the end, I, we are happy that you also brought in SKA, the very futuristic uh, device, and uh, GMRT is playing a big role, uh, you know, in the control system, in the uh, data handling. And I mean, it's very complicated uh, kind of device, as you mentioned, spread over. Uh, two continents in some sense. And uh, we all know GMRT has been providing the top ranking business all, all along and is also a much sought after machine by the world of astronomers. And uh, we also were quite, uh, you know, kind of uh, interested to kind of know that uh, GMRT has also played a major role in many other international missions, adding a lot of value, uh, both physics and sometimes maybe uh, certain diagnostics, certain operational information and so on and so forth. So this is also a very, very interesting aspect, not just only, you know, collecting uh, bread and butter data, but also looking at many things happening around and helping many missions uh, to their success and so on. So we all know the success story and I hope the younger generation are really inspired and uh, uh, by your talk. Uh, we do have quite a few questions, so let me quickly take uh, them. Uh, so, Bandhan Goel. Hello. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, sir, for the talk. I have two uh, questions. One is the follow-up from uh, how resolution is improved from by increasing the baseline. So, you were mentioning that something has to do with inverse Fourier transforms. Please suggest a source, maybe if a book 
somewhere tackles particularly this question of how baseline is uh, by increasing the baseline we get more resolution um, so yeah so this is as i was saying earlier that um the the so let me put it another way when you make the antenna bigger and bigger it gives you more resolution right so what part of that antenna is giving you the high resolution the fact that you're collecting the signals from further and further locations right they're all part of one parabolic antenna fine but supposing you can't build such a big antenna but you were able to collect signals from spot locations of uh, on a dish and bring them together right then you would ask can i now get the close to that resolution that the big dish offered okay and that is exactly what is happening so it is an unfilled aperture you that big parabolic dish you would have liked is not there you have got only bits and pieces of it from the uh, uh, from the many small antennas and now you are trying to uh, see if these bits and pieces can be combined to give you the resolution that the big uh, continuous Uh, aperture would have offered and in principle you can see that that should be possible right the thing yeah. is that uh, what is the operation to be done in order to recover that information and what is to be done about the fact that there is missing information that this dish is not complete there are only bits and pieces of it and how do you do that so those are the two aspects that go into the uh, the how you understand the technique and make use of it but the basic idea is just that and i just try to explain it from the point of view of you know how can two antennas give you some useful information and the way to think about that is again go back to the uh, young's double slit experiment and uh, and think of what the response of a pair of antennas would be and uh, that is a complementary view that uh, you can think of it as giving you one fourier component of the image and then you uh, build that up from many many such pairs of antennas uh, so that you have the image reconstruct uh, done in the fourier domain from which you reconstruct it yeah. so i don't know if i'm just repeating what i said earlier if that helps you to understand the thing better so is there a book where i can just check out you want a reference yeah yeah, yeah sure yeah. yeah yeah there is a there is a uh, there is a book called interferometry and aperture synthesis uh which is you write to me i'll give you the full reference okay i'll mail you yeah. yeah so second question i have is on similar line so when we compare the optical uh, mirror and the radio mirror in the telescope so uh, that the optical one are usually continuous whereas uh, there are grid like things in the uh, radio one so i am not able to understand this physically like uh, so when we talk about uh, electromagnetic uh, rays like a uh, light so the uh, wavelength we are talking about is not spatial wavelength but it is the amplitude of the electromagnetic field so how that amplitude in the field is uh, like uh, affecting the spatial uh, part of the dish no so the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave is not really affecting the spatial aspect it is the question that the spatial aspect has to do with how many directions in the sky are you receiving this uh, plane waves of electromagnetic radiation from of different and they may be of different amplitudes right so if you think of an object which has an angular extent in the sky what that means is that it is sending you wave fronts from a range of angles which is the angle subtended by the source right yeah. and these wave fronts are being picked up by the end, by the uh, telescope which is true in all telescopes and your ability to be able to discern wave uh, wave fronts coming from slightly different directions is the resolution okay that does not necessarily depend upon the amplitude of those wave fronts obviously of course if the amplitude uh, of the wave front is zero then there is no signal coming from that direction but even if they were of equal amplitude or of slightly varying amplitude it is uh, that doesn't have a direct bearing on your ability to discern the fact that there are wave fronts from different directions coming to you that is what the resolution allows you to then discern that i'm getting radiation from this direction and a nearby direction and a nearby direction uh, i'm no i'm not clear about the uh, photon part like if i consider a photon is coming so the wavelength we talk about of light that is the uh, 
like the variation of the electric and magnetic field line fields but when we talk about the telescope so we can't do the same with the optical telescope because that needs a continuous mirror no so i don't understand why uh, why uh, the photon aspect requires a continuous mirror i mean the continuous mirror is only that uh, you every bit of radiation falling is being collected yeah but if you don't have a continuous you can do you can have a optical telescope without a continuous mirror if you want to okay it will still function but okay. it will have some imperfections just like the radio uh, array has yes. some imperfections which you have to worry about when we make the image okay i see yeah so i think let us uh, move on uh, there are still a couple of more questions so uh, hari om uh, please ask your question uh, yeah Richard. sir uh, can this uh, jmrt can can it detect this uh, gamma ray burst uh, Uh, because we are detecting this lower frequency radio waves yes uh, indeed it can and it has been used to detect uh, grbs and that is because any of these uh, events uh, although it's called a gamma ray burst and that is called so because the uh, basic signal um, when the phenomena happens uh, is a gamma ray emission but it is actually an explosive event and that explosion uh, sends a shock wave out Uh, from the object into the surrounding medium and uh, the interaction of this then produces radiation at lower uh, uh, frequencies uh, including radio waves it comes much later in time than the original flash of gamma rays and but it does come and uh, uh, these things have been detected with radio waves you have to follow that object for many days to weeks to months and you will see a small a slow decaying uh, um, burst of radio uh, which allows you then to understand the properties of the circum uh, you know i'll use the word circumstellar assuming that it was a star like object but the medium around the object that went through this cataclysmic event which allows you to infer some of because that medium uh, was originally sort of would have been created by the object just like the sun's surrounding are created by the plasma that the sun is continuously emitting and uh, uh, the, uh, as it goes through the various phases uh, it will keep sending out gas and plasma and, uh, um, and 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 so that helps you to understand the properties of the progenitor objects uh, which went through this cataclysmic event to produce a gamma ray burst so so just to give you a short answer yes uh, the gamma ray bursts are seen in radio waves and uh, the many of them have been observed with the gmrt thank you sir uh, the last question probably will take one from shailesh hello am i audible yeah yes yeah, sir my question is the radio sources are not coherent so the interference pattern like in young's double slit uh, experiment as well the source was made fairly coherent by first passing it through a single slit and then incident uh, it was incident on double slit so that sort of thing is not possible here so the interference pattern that may be uh, that may be generated by the several dishes may keep on changing because there is no constant phase relation between the dishes so there is a uh, difference between uh, the spatial coherence and the temporal coherence so uh, what you are talking about is the the temporal coherence which decides the steadiness of the fringe but you can detect that signal instantaneously and be able to extract the amplitude of the correlated signal so uh, that it's a fine detail but uh, we can go into that in a separate detailed discussion or i can the same reference that the other person asked i can send you that reference which explains how this works okay thank you and can i have another question yeah yeah quickly we have uh, already 35 yeah please short question yeah my question is like generally when we are trying to correlate uh, different experiments to get a better uh, data we 
think uh, we uh, prefer that the experiment have similar properties like in this case we may prefer that the telescopes have similar uh, size and focal lengths so in the long baseline uh, experiments or the very long baseline ones the telescopes may be having different properties so does that complicate the process or yes. we don't have to worry about that yes you are right it com it does complicate the process Uh, and you have to take some special precaution when you combine the signals from very dissimilar uh, telescopes for a variety of reasons uh, uh, but you're right and uh, but it's uh, it's doable uh, you can handle those complexities and still extract uh, useful information okay thank you uh, though i said last question but i feel like taking this i hope the answer and question also will be short does the shape of antenna have any effect on signal sensitivity shape of the antenna yeah uh, i don't know exactly what you mean by the shape of the antenna in the sense that the basic antenna needs to be a reflector which brings a plane Six. parallel wavefront to a focus now it can do that at a primary focus or it can do it at a secondary or tertiary focus but it has to do that if that shape deviates from that then obviously it will not work as an antenna now that's it uh, even the uh, and you would have seen that when i showed you the sk antennas they look different from the gmt antenna i think that's what has transpired this question yes and uh, that is a finer detail so what happens is in a prime focus antenna like the gmt the structure which is sitting at the focus uh, that is actually is obstructing part of the incoming radiation and not only really obstructing but it is also uh, disturbing the wave front uh, because uh, you know it does uh, funny things to the uh, electric field uh, that uh, you know so ideally you would not want it over there and you say well how do i do this so if you think of a parabola uh, what is called an off axis parabola that you can uh, take the section of the parabola which is not centered around its main axis and use that and then its focus will be at a location which is away from the center and that is what this has so you see here uh, this is where the focus is it's again it's not a primary focus it's, a, it's a, it reflects this further to electronics which is located over here but the point is that bulk of this radiation which is falling on this part of the antenna is unobstructed by this structure so in that sense which is different from this antenna which is shown in the background where this structure in the middle will uh, partially distort the incoming radiation field and you have to worry about it as to what it does to your final image that you make and uh, in that sense the shape of the antenna does make a difference uh, but i don't know if that was the nature or the intent of your question yeah yeah i i think that was the from the timing i realized that is question and this uh, your answer was uh, very nice in that sense yeah very good and he says that is what he wanted to ask yeah. okay uh, there are uh, shwant also quite a few questions on youtube but i think uh, we'll try to answer them offline and because uh, you already took uh, a lot of time in uh, not only giving the talk but lots of questions and discussion so would sure. like to thank uh, you on behalf of uh, the ino project and also all the participants here thanks also to the participants especially the young ones who have asked several questions which uh, brought out uh, much more information and details uh, from ishwan so thank you all of you thank you also for stress one for is a very very nice talk and uh, and all the best for your future projects Ishwant. thank you and uh, thanks for organizing this uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to um, uh, various people uh, especially the younger generation to um, expose them to the different kinds of things that are happening and going on that's right Thank you so thank you once all and good night okay then